Hello, everyone, and welcome to Post Podium, a podcast where former Jeopardy contestants are instead given questions and asked to provide answers. I'm your host, Jarek Bruel, and joining me today is Danielle Maurer, a digital marketing manager from Peachtree Corners, Georgia. Danielle is best known for ending Jeopardy Ultra champion Matea Roach's 23 game run on May 6, 2022. She went on to win one more game before finishing as the runner-up in her third and final appearance, taking home a total of $29,999. Danielle has firmly cemented herself in Jeopardy history by adding to a growing list of giant killers from Season 38, which already includes Rowan Talsma, who spoke about his win over Amy Schneider last episode, Nancy Donahauer, who ended Jonathan Fisher's 11-game run, and Jonathan Fisher himself, who ended Matt Amodio's 38-game run. And as of the recording of this intro... Ryan Long has just been defeated by Eric Ahasik, ending his 16-game run. Similar to my interview with Roan, I'll be asking Danielle to recount her thoughts before and after facing off against Matea, and to provide us with a little insight into how she prepared for the challenge ahead of her. The following conversation will include game and outcome spoilers from Danielle's episodes, so as always, if you haven't watched them already, I suggest you watch those episodes first and listen to this podcast later. We hope you enjoy this episode of Post Podium. Let's start with a quick introduction, uh, your name, when you made your Jeopardy debut, and how you did and finished. My name is Danielle Maurer. My Jeopardy debut was on Friday, May 6th, and I won. I beat 23-day champion Matea Roach and uh, won with $15,600. For the second time on this podcast, we not only have another guest who played against Matea Roach, but we also have another giant killer Shout out to Mike and Roan, by the way. If you haven't listened to their episodes, go check them out after this. Welcome to the show, Danielle. So great to have you on Post Podium to talk about, among other things, your contestant experience. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and uh, before we get into it, I should let you and everyone else know that my voice might not be up to par because you know how when you're at a party and there's like music blaring and you try to talk to someone and it's like really hard to hear them? Yeah, that's that's pretty much what I did last night. So um, I apologize if my voice isn't up to snuff. I know May 6th sounds like it was forever ago, but the day is close enough to have me ask you first about your Jeopardy! watch party experience. You were on for three episodes total, so tell us, how did you organize your watch parties, who came, and what was everyone's initial reaction like to your win over Matea? We definitely had a party for the for Friday. I, I would have probably had a party regardless of whether or not I won or lost. But knowing that I won and knowing that it was kind of it was a pretty big win, and you know my family being aware, my parents in particular being aware of what had happened, um, we decided to throw a party here at my house. Um, so my house is um, we have a pool out back. So we figured in the interests of you know trying to be cognizant of of COVID stuff. Um, as well as it being a pretty nice day out. Ultimately, um, we had a pool party out back. Nice. Uh, We had, we had a little bit of food catered in. I got a cake made that had the Jeopardy board on it, decorated where the category said, congrats, Danielle on it. And we actually brought the TV outside and had it plugged into one of our external outlets. Oh, nice. (laughs) Yeah. So we actually, we like set up a our deck has two levels. So we set up almost like a movie theater style uh, set of seats uh, for everyone in the family who had come to sit down and, and watch. It was pretty nice. Honestly, I think it was pretty good. We, I don't, I don't have cable. I'm a cord cutter millennial. Uh, <laughs> so it took us a little while to figure out exactly how we were going to, to watch the show. Um, you know, I'm sure any other cord cutters out there know it can be a little bit challenging. I'm, I'm really accustomed to watching the show sort of, almost reruns essentially whenever Netflix or Hulu puts up, puts up a batch of episodes. So um, had to figure out how to watch it live. And what we ended up deciding on was Hulu live for a month cost isn't too terrible. And then um, we could, we could watch it live on Hulu through our local channels. That yeah, was great. We had a great time. And, and of course, um, everyone was cheering and clapping and yelling. It was a good thing we were outside every time I got a, cl- I got a question, right. Mm-hmm. Or, um, anytime I opened my mouth on camera, really. <laughs> um, and so when, when I did win, everyone just went, you know, ballistic. And, and I had, I had already started receiving messages from people who were in markets where it airs at an earlier time mm. um, who were freaking out. So I was trying to not give it away for the people who were there with me, um, but also still respond and not be rude to people who were messaging me who had already seen it and knew that I'd won. So the the rest of the night after that's kind of a blur. Getting congratulations from I felt like everyone that 
I have ever talked to in my life. Why Jeopardy? Are you a huge fan of the show? Is it because trivia is a hobby of yours? Were you a good student? Maybe did academic quiz bowl? Tell us in your words, Danielle, why you decided to audition for the show. Yeah, um, it's it's a little bit of everything, I would say. So I've been trying to get on Jeopardy since I was a teenager, actually. I've always been a pretty good student. I love learning and I love reading about new things and and just reading all the time. That's what I was doing, actually, before I came over here uh, to do this podcast. And I just acquired a lot of knowledge out of doing that over the years. And I grew up watching Jeopardy on TV at my parents' house. We would watch Jeopardy and the Wheel of Fortune, not every night, but most nights, because I enjoyed it. And I was always very good at it, even as a kid. And so the first time I went to audition was pretty much right after I had become eligible for the teen tournament. Um, this was back when Jeopardy still did in-person auditions. And so my dad had to drive me three hours to Baltimore uh, so that I could try out. You know, they give you some little swag at the in-person auditions or they used to. And uh, one of the things we got there was a hat that my dad still had and dug out of wherever it was hidden in my parents' house and wore to my party on May 6th. And since then, I've just, I've been trying basically whenever I can and whenever I can remember. Um, it's a little bit easier these days with the anytime test because you don't have to wait for that one time of year when the test mm. uh, is available. And then God forbid you're not available at, at those hours and you can't take it. And so you, you've you missed your eligibility for a year. But I want to say this was something like my seventh time in the contestant pool. It's it's It, it was a long time coming. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Did you go to multiple in-person auditions um, over the years when you started auditioning for the teen tournament? Yeah, I've been to several. Um, some of them stick out more than others. Um, so like I remember very vividly going to one in Washington, D.C. This was mm, I feel like this was like maybe a year or so out of college. My mother went with me to that one. Um, I know I've been to one here in Atlanta in downtown. I've been to one in Savannah. I mean, they, they used to change the locations pretty frequently. So mm. um, you never quite knew. And there was one year where I was going to I was going to do it in one location and then I ended up moving, um, moving between states. And so and I, I don't think I was able to reschedule that interview, even though uh, I had qualified to go to the in-person so yeah i've been to been to several did you ever run into like the same people at like consecutive auditions or like anything of that sort or like make any friends there i don't think i ever ran into anyone at, at consecutive auditions yeah not that i not that i recall everyone's always really nice though at the at the auditions and and you know there's a certain sense of camaraderie i think between people who are jeopardy contestants or want to be Jeopardy contestants. Mm. Everyone is usually pretty, pretty smart and has a shared love of learning and knowledge. So everybody gets along pretty well and is pretty friendly. Yeah, I definitely hope they bring back in-person events. I think those in-person events are important to like foster the Jeopardy community, I guess, because, you know, with COVID and everything, there's not really a way other than like, I don't know, online groups and like forums to like talk about the show and whatnot. So I think uh, it's not just a great opportunity to, you know, try to get on the show, but also get to meet, like like you said, like-minded people. So really hope they bring that back in the future. Yeah, I mean, the, the anytime test and the way they have the way they have things set up now, you know, it has its pros and cons. Yeah, yeah, you don't you don't get the I don't think you get quite the same sense of camaraderie. And it's a little bit harder to play the mock game during your interview when mm. you're doing it online, because you, you really don't get the same sense of how the buzzer works as you did when you were actually in person and they have a physical buzzer there to give you. Mm. Um, but at the same time, like I said, with the anytime test being literally anytime, it's more flexible. And for people who can't travel and don't have the time to, you know, take a day off and drive two hours to wherever their nearest city audition is mm. um you know it's more flexible that way and i think i think we're actually seeing some of the results of that with the more recent seasons because they i think they've opened up a group of people who otherwise probably wouldn't have auditioned for the show for sure now that you've achieved your goal what's next for you in terms of your trivial pursuit should we expect you to appear on another game show in the future or was being on jeopardy your first and final television appearance I don't know. I'd, I'd love to do another one. You know, I, there's a certain period of time where I'm not allowed to do anything else mm -hmm. because of Jeopardy. But um, once that expires, I don't know, maybe I'll maybe I'll apply for like the chase or something. Mm -hmm. um, there's some game shows where I feel like being a former Jeopardy contestant, maybe you would be less likely to get you on the show like The Weakest Link. But yeah, I could probably see myself applying for the chase. No idea if I would get on it or not, but that would be fun. And I keep, I keep an eye out for uh, for trivia shows just out of curiosity, give them a watch and see if they're any good. That's my current favorite other than Jeopardy at the moment. Yeah, it definitely seems like the chase is like a pipeline for like former Jeopardy contestants to like 
either redeem themselves or like make a comeback of some sort against you know one of the biggest trivia titans out there with you know buzzy brad uh who else is on there uh james <laughs> so james is on there james honestly james would be the most scary one to go up against oh, for sure yeah <laughs> actually <laughs> For me, it actually might be Brad because you don't like suspect him at all. And whenever I'm watching the chase, he always puts on like this, like humbleness. But he's like out there to get you. I don't know. It, I just feel like that's ten times more scarier than like how James approaches it, where he just is like intimidates you right off the bat. It's James, James's get rate is just so high, and when he's on fire, he just doesn't miss questions. So mm. it would have been either if. James or the Beast would have been the mm. two that would have been the most scary for me. And the, the Beast isn't on the show anymore, which, you know, very sad about. But those would have been the two that I've been like, oh, God, <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Once you were told you'd get to be on Jeopardy, how did you prepare yourself mentally? We've already had a bunch of different approaches and perspectives shared on this podcast on how to and what a prospective contestant should study. So, Danielle, did you attempt to cram more knowledge? What resources did you use? And did you place any emphasis on studying one subject over another? That's a great question. Uh, so I took sort of a, I guess I'll call it a, sort of a three-pronged approach here because when you when I found out I had three weeks and three weeks isn't a lot of time mm -hmm. and there's only so much you can realistically do to prepare during those three weeks. So I had to sit down and think to myself, you know, after my first day, which was mostly just celebrating the news, I kind of buckled down and was like, all right, what is it actually realistic for me to achieve in three weeks? And there's certain things that are difficult to study too. So what I ended up doing from a studying perspective was just really trying to make sure that I had reviewed knowledge in a lot of key areas that tend to come up a lot in Jeopardy. So things like US presidents, uh, world geography and world capitals, the sort of things that you can cram pretty easily. Um, and if you didn't know it and you lost because of that, you'd feel pretty bad. And that was pretty simple. I mean, I, I made a lot of flashcards. I used a lot of Sporkle quizzes. I read a lot of Wikipedia articles, particularly ones that were clustered together by my husband to give me good grounding. I specifically asked him to make me a 20th century history uh, study guide, which was, again, mostly comprised of Wikipedia articles, because I never actually reached a good chunk of the of the 20th century in any history class I ever took in school. So mm. I wanted him to kind of put together for me some things that I should go read, which he did, and did a great job of. Um, and then one of my other friends put, she was an English major in college, so she put together for me a really great literature, classical literature and poetry study guide as well. Again, just like common book titles, you know, fun facts that I don't know about the authors, things like that. Um, so that was that was pretty helpful and it was good for what it was. But I would say the bulk of the bulk of the practice that really helped me was just practicing playing the game. And I think there's a lot to be said for being comfortable with the rhythm of the game and, and the actual going through the motions of playing it so that when you're on stage, it's not new and foreign and you're not wasting time and energy and headspace remembering that you have to call the next clue or, or reminding yourself to answer in the form of a question. Mm. You really want that to sort of be second nature so you don't have to think about it and you can devote all of your brain power just to answering questions. So we set up our own Jeopardy board here in the house. I got a whiteboard and markers and we set it up, you know, wrote out all the amounts and everything. And then we went to J archive and we would pick a game and put the categories up. And then we had clicky pens and my, my best friend was acting as our Ken slash Mayim slash Alex and would read the clues. And my husband was my competition. So he would try to out buzz me and outplay me as much as possible. And then it just let me, practice playing the game mm. and also gave me a really good sense of what categories was I really good at? What categories was I not so good at? You know, what are your sort of gut check reaction bets on a daily double when you find one? Um, you know, how comfortable are you uh, betting big or betting small and getting practice calling those numbers out so that you're not, again, you're not spending your headspace when you actually get on stage thinking about all those things so much. And, and knowing too that Jeopardy films a five episodes a day, depending on, you know, if I won and how many times I won, there was a chance I'd have to play five games in a day. And that's honestly, that's exhausting. Mm. So practicing the endurance as well to play three to five games every night for three weeks. Sounds like you really like immersed yourself there. And like, like you said, try to imagine yourself up there on stage. I, I really like that. That's a very unique approach. I don't think anybody has shared that before on this podcast. That's, that's amazing. 
Um, and it sounds like you had a lot of support too. Um, I don't think uh, anybody else on the podcast has had uh, like that much like group support, like helping them to like get on the show. So that's really good that you had like, you know, your husband and your best friend helping you out. That that sounds great. Yeah, they were so excited for me and they 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 knew how much it meant to me to be on the show finally and, and wanted to help in any way that they can. And it was so funny, like leading up to it. Anytime we talked about, OK, when you go out, it, it wasn't if you win, it was when you win. Right. So mm-hmm. just like even even to the point of just trying to hype me up so that I wasn't thinking that there was any possibility that I might lose before I went out there just so that I was. I was in a good headspace. I mean, they they were fantastic, and and I really truly could not have done it without them. That was the probably the single most helpful thing because when I actually got up on stage and the music starts playing and the lights are going and my brain just settled back into you've been doing this for three weeks. This mm. is fine. The third thing that I did as well was a little bit of wagering study, which if you've seen the episodes, obviously paid off. Mm. Uh, just looking at different strategies for first place, second place based on how much money you had and and what is the game theory behind that of what you should or shouldn't bet, um, especially to given, you know, given the categories and things like that. So yeah, that's, that's my three pronged approach for Jeopardy success. <laughs> so going back to your studying for the show, what category did you feel most prepared for and which one did you feel least prepared for after playing through several rounds of J archive? Ooh, that's a good question. I have a pretty, well-defined set of strengths um and they are things like i'm pretty good at geography just generally um i'm very very good at myth categories because that's always been a personal project of mine and get a myth category i'll go nuts um i'm really good at science fiction and fantasy books whenever they come up which again is pretty rare but um that's a category that i know i can burn through like crazy and i'm generally pretty good at any history category but especially ancient history again Mm -hmm. just sort of a passion of mine um so those are the ones that whenever one of those categories came up it was you know smiles from ear to ear and like i got this i know i got this the categories that i'm not so good at is sports anything related to sports relatable (laughs) and sports is one of those things that's hard to study too like i knew going in if i got sports categories i was gonna be screwed I, i did what i could to mitigate that i actually i made myself a sports study guide where i just went and for like five major sports I went in and pulled a list of like famous players, you know, one or two things to know about them, a little bit on any like championship games that are in that sport and read a little bit about all of those things. And I did actually see a lift in my sports get right. I went from probably getting maybe 20% of sports questions right to 40% of sports questions right, which that's pretty good. (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty good. I was like, I'll take it. But yeah, if any, if any sports category had come up while I was there, I was like, well, that, that one's a loss. That's just. It's not happening. Something that I, as well as a few guests who have been on the podcast before, did to prepare ourselves for the show was reading some Jeopardy reference books written by people who have been on to the Alex, Alex Trebek stage, excuse me, and have that firsthand experience. Two books I read include Secrets of the Buzzer by Fritz Holznagel and Answers in the Form of Questions by Claire McNear. Former is a guide on how to befriend the devil known as the Jeopardy buzzer, while the latter is a sort of behind-the-scenes look of how the game, a game show like Jeopardy is made possible, which includes got testimonies from past contestants, including the late host Alex Trebek. Did you read either of those books? And if so, did you learn anything new from them? I didn't. Um, I thought about it. You know, if you go online and you, like, search Jeopardy prep, a lot of those books do come up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought about it. I thought about getting one. Uh, and, and taking a look and just seeing if there was anything valuable there. But again, I only had three weeks of time. And when I sat down and I thought about it, I was like, what will help me personally the most? And as much as I love reading, I learn best by doing. Mm. And I always have. So if you are if you want to teach me how to do a task, the best thing you can do for me is actually set, set, set it in front of me with a list of instructions and let me try it. And so I was like, you know, ultimately, I think I'm better served by spending as much time as possible practicing the game. And when I'm not practicing the game, I can study a little bit here and there. I considered it a lot that first week after I got the phone call and then hadn't done it. And I didn't feel like I was missing anything by not doing it. So I ended up I ended up not, not getting any of those books or reading them. For those who don't know, when you're up on stage playing Jeopardy, you can't just spam click the buzzer as soon as you know the answer. You have to wait until the host is finished reading the clue and for these white lights that surround the clue board to appear before attempting to buzz in. However, there are some Jeopardy contestants who prefer going off the cadence of the host's voice over waiting for the lights to turn on. 
which leads me to ask Danielle, what method did you use? I know in your post episode reflection on Reddit, you said that the buzzer wasn't exactly your best friend, but I think everyone would still like to know what worked for you since you went on to win not just one, but two games of Jeopardy. I was going off the lights, um, not so much the host uh, speaking. I think if I had been a longer running champion, I probably would have gotten more comfortable going off the cadence of the host's voice. The challenge that I had was my first game was with Ken and then my second game was with him was with Mayan mm -hmm. and they have different cadences to their voice. They speak at different tempos. And I, like I said, I think if I had had Ken for my second game, I maybe would have started to switch, but going to Mayan um, kind of, you know, a completely different, not a completely different game, but a, but a completely different reader in terms of the clues. I didn't feel comfortable doing that. I st I stuck with the lights. And I, f I feel like my reflex time is decent enough that I was I was doing all right looking at the lights and, and waiting for them to buzz in. I felt like I was doing a much better job on on that Monday game and that Tuesday game um, than I had done in my game against Mateo, where I really did feel like, I mean, credit, credit where credit's due. Mateo's great on the buzzer. Um, but I just felt like I was not getting in when I knew clues in that game. Did you have a preferred buzzer grip at all? Was there one position that you felt most comfortable with and stuck to? Yes, uh, definitely. So I will say this uh, for all, all of the Jeopardy fans out there. Um, the buzzer is made for right-handed, generally male players. Um, it is bigger. It's for a bigger hand, and it's oriented toward the right-hand side of the podium. Um, I am a very small five-foot-three woman, and I am left-handed. So I got up on that stage and I was like, okay, I got to figure this out. So what I ended up doing was I had to cross it in front of me to put it in my left hand because I needed my left thumb. My reflex time is going to be way better. But it was it was so big in my hand that I ended up having to sort of brace it in the palm of my right hand. And so if you, if you go back and you watch the episode, you can see I sort of got it cupped in my right hand. Um, and I did feel like that worked pretty well. It gave me a way to, to brace the buzzer. So when I was trying to, um, you know, frantically press down on it, I, I wasn't losing momentum of the push because it does take a little bit of pressure to, to depress that button. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't losing the momentum of the push quite as much because I had it braced against my right hand. I don't think I varied that at all uh, over the course of the games that I played. I felt very comfortable holding it like that. Yeah, I remember for me, I like, I had my hands like crossed in front of me with the buzzer in my right hand and like bracing my right hand with my left arm. I thought that would work for me like in rehearsal, but I quickly realized that that wasn't working for me. So I switched up by putting, actually, no, I started out with my hands behind my back and I started doing it that way and like in the same grip, but then I moved my hands in front of me because I thought that was more comfortable. Cause I, one of my fellow JNCC friends said like, oh, this worked for me. So I thought I would like borrow that in a sense. So I just like experimented and yeah, don't be for future Jeopardy contestants. Don't be afraid to like switch it up mid game, especially if you feel like you're not getting in as much as you, you can. I mean, Daniel, you said you didn't really change it up, but I think um, especially after the first round of Jeopardy, that's like the perfect opportunity to like switch it up if you feel like you weren't getting in as much in the first round. And, and I think, again, I think it really comes down to comfort of the way mm. that you're holding it, right? I mean, it, it's hard to overstate the importance of feeling comfortable on set. The more uncomfortable you feel while you're playing the game, your performance is going to suffer. Um, so the the best thing you can do is whatever makes you relax and makes you feel more comfortable on set. So yeah, if you're if you're trying a position with the buzzer and you don't like it, you should absolutely try switching because it can it can only help you um, if you're not feeling comfortable with it the way that you are holding it. As I produce more episodes of Post Podium, I tend to phase out some questions that. I feel are a bit mundane and generate similar responses from guests, which includes me asking about contestants' interactions and experiences with their respective hosts, either Ken or Mayim. But I'm going to make an exception in this episode because, Danielle, like you mentioned before, you had both Ken and Mayim during your run, and I believe you're the first person on the podcast to experience that. The closest we ever got to that was when I had Kristen and Kira Donegan talk about Mayim and Ken respectively as the host for their episodes, but no one on the podcast has had a host experience quite like yours. So while I know our time as contestants with the host is quite brief, could you share with our listeners your ex personal experience getting to interact and talk to both Ken and Mayim? So I knew going in that my first episode was going to be with Ken, and I was really excited about that because um, if you'd asked me to pick going in, I would have said I would have preferred to have Ken just because, I mean, Ken's the goat, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, 
he's Ken Jennings. I, I obviously wanted the chance to be on stage and meet Ken Jennings. So I was very happy that when I went out there initially, it was Ken. And, and I will say there's something about Ken and the way he hosts the show that is so, I think maybe empathetic is the word that I want. You really get the sense from talking to him both before and during the show that he knows where you are right now. Mm. He's been there. And and there's just there's a sense of camaraderie, I guess, that I got from talking to him that I didn't get from talking to Mayim. Not to say that there's anything wrong with Mayim as a host, but I, I just think that Ken has this, I think he has this way of kind of setting you at ease a little bit when you're on set. You know, you feel like you're in the hands of somebody who knows the show and loves the show and knows knows where you've been. He has just the right thing to say to kind of make you laugh a little bit and help you relax which I, I really appreciated because as you can imagine, going up against Matea Roach on the last game of the day, no less, having watched her defeat four other sets of contestants, um, I was pretty nervous when I walked up on the stage. So that was that was really appreciated. And, and he was very kind. And I, I will take to my grave the fact that at post-show during the credits, uh, you know, he complimented me on playing a very good game of Jeopardy. And, you know, I... That, that could have been it for me. <laughs> I was like, uh, Ken Jennings complimented me on playing a game of Jeopardy. I'm done. Mayim was very different. And again, not in a bad way, but Mayim, I think, is a little bit more of like like a professional host. She was very friendly and very nice and, um, you know, came out before just like Ken did and had, had a nice little conversation with us, talked a little bit about preparing for some of the stories she was going to uh, question us about on the set. It feels more like a game show and less like playing it in your living room mm. when Mayim is is the host, if that makes sense. So on top of, well, on the topic of you um, talking about your contestant stories, I actually want to talk about those because I thought they seemed really interesting when I was like doing some of my research before this podcast. Are you up for going into detail about those stories at all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Great. So the first fact you shared was that you're an author of two high fantasy novels. Before I ask you any more about your background as an author, what exactly is high fantasy for those who don't know? Sure. So high fantasy is the specific subset of fantasy that takes place in the secondary world. So as long as it doesn't take place on our earth, that is a high fantasy. Interesting. Uh, and that's that's typically what I write because I'm lazy and don't like having to do the amount of research required to make sure that I'm getting everything correct if I'm going to write about uh, a particular subset of our world. Are your two high fantasy novels like connected to each other? Are they like first book, second book, or are they like different? No, they're wildly different from each other. Uh, and that's intentional to, to some degree. You know, the first one that I wrote, which is the one that took me 14 years, that was a book that I started in uh, middle school, high school. I don't know, long oh, time wow. ago, anyway. It was a book that I started a long time ago. And it was very much uh, a reaction to the sort of fantasy that I grew up reading. Things like The Lord of the Rings, um, things like The Wheel of Time, the sort of like classic fantasy. And so, and it, it has a lot of that in it, as well as some of the influences, some of the more grimdark things and things like Game of Thrones that were coming out while I was growing up. And it's sort of a, a mishmash of all of that and me kind of condensing all of that down and writing my own little tribute to that style of fantasy and it just it took me so long because it was constantly changing and i was trying to incorporate new things and yeah it just it took a long time the second one is radically different and and it came out of um after i finished my first one and i started trying to query it out to agents um and i was realizing that you know in the 14 years i spent writing it the fantasy genre as a whole had sort of moved on and a lot of the things that i had incorporated were old-fashioned how we say in the genre mm. and I was having a hard time finding agents who were interested in it at all and the best way to deal with rejection um, when you're sending out query after query after query is to go write something else um, that you can focus all your time and energy on so that was what I did I picked picked something else and I I had this idea that was it was silly a lot of the agents that I was looking at said things like they didn't want any book that had chosen one in it because the chosen one trope is so overdone in fantasy, which I get. But the idea I had to myself that it was funny was, well, but what if I wrote a world where like every third person was a chosen one? Wouldn't that be funny? Because like if everyone's chosen, no one is. It could be really interesting. And so I ended up writing an entire book that was literally called Too Many Chosen Ones. And it was a comedic fantasy. It was designed mm. to be funny from the ground up and and it has you know it has a serious story contained within it but i crammed every bit of humor i could into that story wrote it so much faster 
I had a much better process for writing that one. That one, I queried it for a bit and then I gave it a little bit of a rest because I wasn't sure if I wanted to make any edits or changes to it and kind of took a break from writing for a couple of years because the rejection of sending out query letters is, is tough. It can mm. beat you down. So as of right now, neither of them is published. Um, they are sitting in files on my computer. Um, and, you know, maybe someday they will get published, but I'm okay if they don't. Um, I'm working on two new ones right now, and well, maybe one of those will be the one. I read High Fantasy tends to have a really high page count. Is that applicable to your, your two High Fantasy novels? Yes, the first one in particular. Um, at one point, it was over 200,000 words. Oh, my Lord. Uh, which is a lot. <laughs> And I had to, and I got it down to 180 and I was like, this is great. And I started trying to query it and got, got some pretty negative feedback that there was no way anyone was going to take a 180,000 word debut. Like no way I had to get it down underneath 120. So I spent months and months and months cutting and cutting and cutting. And eventually I got it down to like, I think it's like 118,000 words now. Um, I had to tighten it up. It was a good thing, ultimately, that I did tighten it up. I think it reads much better now, but uh, it it meant a lot of killing your darlings and getting mm. rid of things. Yeah, I um, can imagine. The second one I wrote with more brevity to begin with, knowing that I couldn't balloon up to 180,000 words. And so I think that one topped out at like 110, even in its first draft. So that it was much more it was much more manageable from the get go. The second fact you shared was that you like to cosplay and go to Dragon Con, which I looked up earlier. And for those listening, it's a multi genre pop culture convention that happens every Labor Day weekend in Atlanta, Georgia. Is Dragon Con an event you prepare for every year? Will you be attending the next one coming up? Yeah, um, I do go every year for like the last ten ish years. I will be going this year as the plant unless something were to change. I'd love to, to start incorporating some other conventions, but the nice thing about Dragon Con being in Atlanta and I live in, in the Atlanta metro area is that it's sort of my home convention. It's very easy for me to go to every year. Uh, and it is a great convention uh, if you're into the cosplay scene because everybody dresses up at Dragon Con. Everybody. The people watching is amazing. I'm a huge fan of Japanese anime, and so I follow a couple of cosplay accounts on you know Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Are you a fan of anime? If so, what characters would you like to become? If not, where do most of your cosplay inspirations come from? TV, video games, graphic novels? I'm not a huge uh, fan of anime. I like it fine, but I sometimes I try them and I bounce off them pretty hard. Like I could not get into um, Attack on Titan. I tried. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get into it. Um, probably the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart is Full Metal Alchemist. So mm. if I was going to do an anime cosplay, um, I would probably want to do general armstrong because i think mm. she's amazing oh yeah i'm actually watching that series right now and it's pretty good i haven't finished it yet i'm like at like episode 52 or so but I'm, I'm enjoying it so far yeah i love that we've also talked about doing um a group of the homunculi Ooh, uh, which that sounds interesting fun. so you know maybe maybe we'll get there at some point um i would say the majority of the cosplays that i do come from video games and then various television shows uh, typically sometimes movies it just really whatever whatever kind of catches my eye as i'm as i'm playing something or watching something that uh, seems like it would be a fun challenge for me to make although i do sometimes do things that i guess they're not technically japanese anime but i've done several uh, other animated cartoon cosplays so i for instance i have um entrapta from she the princesses of power mm. on netflix and I have an Alucard cosplay specifically from the Castlevania animated series on Netflix as well. I've done a couple of Overwatch characters. My most recent ones that I did, I have um, Nyx from the video game Hades, mm. which was super popular during the pandemic. And then I have um, uh, Agatha Harkness from the TV show WandaVision. What's your favorite cosplay you've made and the most difficult cosplay to make? Favorite and most difficult. Uh, most difficult is it's gotta be, I made a skin for Moira from Overwatch and it's, it was specifically her Banshee skin, which is her Halloween skin. It required a lot of foam work. And at the time I was not super comfortable with working with foam, but there was a lot of prop work that I had to make for that. Um, she has like her backpack, which was a structural nightmare because I wanted to put lights in it and then and getting it to stay on my shoulders and all of that jazz. And then she has like this belt and knee knee pad things. And it, it, there was just a lot of accessory work that had to be done there that took me 
a very long time. The, the clothing component of it was actually easy. And I had that done in like two weeks, but all of the accessories that had to be created um, were really challenging. My favorite one, I think it's NYX, um, at least right now, um, just because I'm really proud of how it turned out. I think it's, it's really beautiful. I tried some new techniques uh, with it. And particularly with sewing things like her, um, her arm guard, I tried this like basket weaving technique I'd seen someone online do, and it actually turned out pretty well and looks good. And I just think, I think it's a really pretty cosplay. And I love like the fabrics that I used and things like that. I have a feeling though, that the one I'm working on right now will ultimately end up being my favorite, uh, assuming it turns out the way I see it in my head, which is still up in the air at this point. So to close this story out, have you been to conventions other than Dragon Con? Are there any specific conventions that you want to attend in the future? Not yet. Uh, it's, it's Ironically, it was something I intended to do in 2020. And then, you know, but there are some that I want to go to that I haven't been to yet. Um, my sister keeps advocating for me to go to Megacon, which is in Orlando. Mm. Um, she's been twice now uh, and really enjoyed it both times. Momocon is the other big one that happens here in Atlanta. So again, it's, it's not very far away. It's a little bit more anime focused, which is one of the reasons why I haven't gone. But mm. um, I'm thinking about giving that one a shot. Um, I would really love to go to um, Gen Con. Uh, which is in Ohio. Uh, and that's like a more tabletop and board game focused convention. Uh, but I think that would be really, really fun to go to. Um, maybe one of the PAXs. I've heard mm. good things about the, those as well. PAX East, mm. um, PAX South, and PAX Unplugged, I think are the three that I've, I know people who've been to um, and seem really fun. Um, it's just, it's a question ultimately of, you know, time of year and can I get the time off and how much does the t travel and the tickets cost and things like that. And, Having Dragon Con in my backyard makes, you know, again, I've said this, I said this before, but I'm a little bit lazy. So having Dragon Con in my backyard makes it more of a challenge for me to kind of must muster up the effort to figure out where else I'm going to go. But I do intend to do that at some point. So the last story you shared on Jeopardy was that you got to sing at the Korean DMZ as a choral singer, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Could you tell us more about the series of events which led you to sing at the 38th Parallel? Uh, so I've been, I've been in choirs, um... Well, I haven't been any, in any recently. It's a little harder to do, I think, when you're an adult um, outside of like a church choir. But when I was in school, I was in choir all through middle school and high school and then again in college. And in college, we had um, our chamber singers group, which was our sort of elite group. And that was the group that went on tour. And they came to us and announced that we were going to South Korea, um, which I was really excited about because I had never been to Asia at all. And we were going to be in South Korea for, I want to say it was like, 10 days. It wasn't full two weeks, but I think it was 10 days. A decent amount of time. Um, they had, you know, an agenda for us so that we, we were going to get to do, you know, activities and, and fun things and educational things while we were there. But then we would have a performance basically every day, typically in the evening, sometimes during the middle of the day, depending on, depending on what it was. Don't ask me how they got this gig that we, we would be singing for the soldiers. It was in a, it was in a church on like I want to say it was it was in like a South Korean camp that was like right on the edge of the demilitarized zone. We almost thought we weren't going to go on that night because while it was like the week before we traveled, um, North Korea had sunk a submarine off the South Korean coast. And so they were kind of on high alert. And a bunch of the soldiers that were supposed to be there had been redeployed because the tensions were a little higher. So the audience was smaller than we had anticipated but it was it was this it was not a very large church um it was kind of a more intimate setting and you know we had a predefined set of songs that we sang and we, we didn't really do anything different than we normally would but it just there was there was something about you know given given the way everything was sort of tense at the time and they were just all in a headspace where that particular song meant something a little extra and it helped that it, again, it, I, it was in Korean. So it wasn't like I was singing it in English or Latin, which if, again, I think is great, but you don't parse the meaning quite so much um, as you do when it's in the language that you speak. Did you get to like explore it all or like go around in the city and yeah. like, see what it was like? Yeah, we, we spent a good bit of time in Seoul. Obviously we went out to the DMZ. We actually got to stay at a Buddhist monastery in the mountains overnight. And we got, so we actually got to attend service there at the monastery. Uh, and ring the bells with the monks and um, like we ate we dressed in like the habits I guess you call it of the monks um, we ate in their cafeteria it was a really really interesting experience to get to see how they live 
we also went to forgive me if there's any South Korean people on this podcast listening. I think it's Chuncheon is the name of the city, which was like a little bit more in the middle of the peninsula. And we stayed with host families while we were in Chuncheon. So oh, wow, nice. like actual uh, South Korean families um, who were members of the church that we were singing at while we were there, who took, you know, one or two students in for the night. And so we actually got to stay with them in their house and they took us out for dinner. And uh, we actually went out karaoke with our host family, which was super fun. So yeah, it was, it was, it was a really good time. We got, we actually got to, to explore and see things. And I mean, we stopped at this historical village, which I think was much more of a, I think it was much more of an attraction for school children in South Korea. So there's all these teeny little kids running around who can't be more than like 10. And then there's this group of American college students <laughs> who are having just as much fun as the 10 year old school children who were all precious and adorable. They thought we were fascinating. We kept getting them coming up. <laughs> <laughs> they were coming up and saying hello to us. I don't think they spoke any other English, but they were coming up and saying hello to us. And they wanted pictures of every single one of us. Oh my god! <laughs> on their on their phones, um, they were just they were adorable and so precious. And I'm pretty sure somewhere I have a picture with a bunch of children who were so excited. <laughs> uh, so we we did that, and we went and saw. Um, I think it's like the Imperial palace complex outside of Seoul. We had to see all kinds of really amazing things while we were there in addition to, you know, performing. Now we finally arrived at the part of the show where we take a look at each of your games and analyze some of the game dynamics and how certain decisions might have affected the outcome, starting with your Jeopardy debut against Matea. Most of the stuff I have here written in my notes can already be answered by reading your post-episode reflection on Reddit, but perhaps you can elaborate more on what you said or maybe mention something you left out of that post. So when Roan was on the podcast last episode, he told us that he wasn't worried about the possibility of facing a super champ when, in retrospect, he probably should have. Thus, once he met Amy, he made peace with the fact that he probably wouldn't win. You, on the other hand, said that you totally expected a super champ to be waiting for you at the Sony Pictures lot. So you were able to, as I had put it, resign yourself much more earlier than Roan did. Even though you felt fully prepared to face a super champion, once you met Matea and heard she'd won 19 games in a row... Were you able to remain calm and level-headed? Because it's one thing to see a boulder come hurling towards you, but once you actually get hit by it, that's a completely different feeling. Yeah, and, I, and again, I think this is sort of the difference in like a boulder appearing out of the sky and you having no clue it's coming at you and then looking up and seeing it versus you knew someone was going to throw a boulder at you and so you're sort of just waiting for it and then when you see it coming down out of the sky, you're like, aha, and you're able to like, step to the side and it misses you by three inches, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I expected it. I did. When I got the call that I was going to go in, Amy's episodes were actually airing. So of course I, you know, my parents were like, oh my God, are you going to have to play Amy? And I'm like, yeah, no, there's like a three month delay. Amy probably won't be on the show. God, I hope Amy is not on the show anymore. I said, but with the way the season's been going, I would be silly if I didn't expect Super Champion. So I played, I did all my practice, all those games that we played, sort of assuming I was playing against some, someone like Amy and we would compare, uh, you know, Amy got these, this question right and you didn't or vice versa. You got this one right and she didn't. So you would have done really well in this game. So I was sort of already in that mentality and we had had several conversations between my husband and I about how to, how to play a game like that, you know, what you have to do in order to win. And so I knew going in and, and I had, I had actually practiced hunting daily doubles and doing the bounce because I figured, well, Amy didn't play like that. So if I was going up against a champion like Amy, that was, I was going to have to hunt the daily. So it wasn't going to be much of an option for me because the buzzer advantage is so great. Mm. So when I walked in to the studio that morning and they introduced Matea as an, at the time, 19 day champion, I could sort of hear the intake of breath from all the other contestants and kind of feel the mood in the room start to drop. And for me, it was just like, all right, you know, that's what I expected. This isn't really surprising. Hopefully I'll be able to do well. Just please do not pick me for the first game of the day. I want the chance to actually see how she plays so that I can see if I need to make any strategic adjustments before I have to go out there and play her. And then I didn't get picked for the Monday game. I ended up getting picked for the Friday game, which meant that I had four games to watch 
and to get a sense for how Mateo played. And I ended up sitting there in the audience thinking the strategy I came here with is going to work pretty well. Um, you know, assuming I can get in on the buzzer. So I'll do the best that I can. And she's a super champ. I'm not going to feel bad if I lose to her. Um, I just want to go out there and like, feel like I did a good job at the end of the day. That's a perfect response because I was actually going to ask you if you made some micro adjustments before watching your play and after. And it sounds like that you even went into it knowing like what you needed to do. Cause it sounds like Matea played in a sort of similar way that like Amy played in that, like she, she wouldn't really go after the daily doubles. And I think both of them went from top down if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Matea usually went top down and did not hunt dailies and, and honestly was, was a fairly risk averse better. And I am also a risk averse better, but I knew going in, especially going against a super champion, that that wasn't going to fly. Mm. That I was going to have to stick flight in the ground and say, look, I'm going to have to take some big risks or I am not going to win. And my husband and I had a lot of conversations about playing the game to maximize your earnings versus playing the game to win mm. and how comfortable I was with playing both of those ways and what that would require. And what I ultimately defaulted to was I want to win the game. Mm. The amount of money that I end up with, I don't care as much about, but I want to win the game. I wasn't going in necessarily with the Holtzhauer version of the strategy where you start with all the $2,000 clues in, in, in Double Jeopardy and try to get all the money off the bottom of the board. I sort of had a more hybridized approach where left to my druthers, which I didn't feel like I exercised this more in the following weeks, but my intention was to start somewhere around the middle of the board, around the middle row, and kind of get a sense for each of the categories first but still sort of bypassing the upper clues and mm. trying to hunt for the dailies and then come down and work through the bottom of the board while bouncing between categories. That sounds similar to what Roan said last week about like taking the middle approach because knowing he his trivia chops weren't like up to par as like Amy's was. So he kind of like went with the middle to try to get some money in and then maybe a daily double would be in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, statistically, you know, you, they tend to be at the bottom and they also for some reason tend to be in the bottom left, <laughs> I guess, according yeah. to heat maps that I've seen. So I had practiced that and I had practiced the bounce because the bounce can really throw you off. Oh yeah. If you're, if you really require to be like in the headspace of whatever the category is and you have a hard time remembering the category, don't do it. Don't do the bounce. Don't, don't do anything that's going to impact negatively impact your own performance, but that doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm usually pretty good about being able to remember which category I'm in. And so I felt pretty comfortable and okay doing that. So getting into the game itself, I have to give huge props to you, Danielle, for making the first daily double a true daily double, which doubled your score from 2800 to 56. I know whenever I'm sitting at home watching the show, I always yell at my TV, begging the contestants to go all in because, you know, mathematically speaking, most of the money to be made in the game can be found in double Jeopardy. So even if you wipe out in the first daily double, it should be theoretically easier to make a comeback in the second round. Is there anything you could tell us about that first daily double, which might have affected your decision to go all in? It's so funny uh, that you say that because I'm exactly the same way. <laughs> um, I, I always sit at home and watch Jeopardy and watch people get the daily doubles and be in second or third place and be like, I'll have a thousand dollars, please. And I'm like, why? Why are you doing that? Bet more money. And so I made, again, I am a risk averse better naturally, but I told myself I'm not going to play that way when I go in there because this is the exact same thing I get mad about when I'm watching the show. Mm. I want to win. And in order to do that, I do have to take a little bit of a risk. So when I was up there for that first daily, I felt decent about the category, despite the website domain question, which I was very annoyed by, but I had to put kind of had to put behind me. Otherwise, I felt pretty good about the category. I work in digital marketing, so I do a lot with computers. And I'm decently good at parsing other languages, even ones that I don't really have any experience speaking. So I felt like I stood a good chance of getting it right. At that point, I had figured out that Matea was amazing on the buzzer. And I was never going to outdo her there. So I had to make the most of what I could get my hands on. And like you said, it was still the first round. And I figured... If I wipe out here, I wipe out here. Most of the money is in double jeopardy. I'll try to make it up there, but I should at least make the attempt. And with having 28, you know, I thought about it. I was like, oh, do I do 2000? And I was like, no, you know what? If this is the only episode I get to be on, I want to speak the words. I'd like a true daily double on mm. national television. I felt completely comfortable and happy with my decision. And I, in fact, after, after I, I did that and I got it, the first thing that went through my head was, well, if I lose this game, I got to do that. <laughs> true. Very true. 
Um, other than the final Jeopardy, you know, wager reveal, I think this next point I have is probably my second favorite highlight of this game. Uh, 4N for 2000, the third daily double of the game. You said on Reddit this was an instant get for you, but you still took the full length of time to count the letters in the word enunciation. Luckily, you just managed to start your response right before you were timed out and picked up an additional 5,000. While you were on set, did the game stop at all to check the audio playback to see if your response was in time? And if so, how long did it take to come up with a ruling? Um, they didn't stop the game. Oh, wow. They didn't stop the game. There was We kept we kept going. So I don't think, I think from their perspective, it must have been clear cut. That was definitely a nail fighter because, yeah, I grew up Catholic. I knew the answer it had to be Annunciation. I'm an art history minor. I've seen a million paintings titled Annunciation. I don't know, those lights, they just do something to your brain and you're standing <laughs> up there and you're like, where's the fourth N? And the thing about the dailies is one of the big advantages, aside from being able to control your wager, is you have the 10 seconds of time that is yours and yours alone and no one can take it away from you. So if you're in a category, especially a wordplay category like that, where jumping the gun and giving it and just blurting out an answer could shoot you in the foot, you have 10 seconds to think about it. And you always feel bad when you see someone on the show who does that, who's like shouts out the answer right away. And then you see it on their face when they realize they said the wrong thing or like the word they said didn't meet the category or whatever. Mm. And they remind you of that going in when they're when they're going over all the rules that, you know, this is the amount of time you have as long as you start saying the answer before the buzzer goes off, it will be accepted. And I knew that. So we couldn't figure out where the fourth N was in enunciation which is now something I won't forget until the day I die. Because then I was like, no, I'm not going to blurt it out because I want to see if I can figure out where the fourth N is. And as the time was running out, I was like, it's, it's got to be right. It's, it's just, it's, it has to be right. It has to be right. If there's somewhere, I'm just freaking out because I'm on Jeopardy and barely got it out, which I guess gives you some sense of what my sense of innate timing is mm. that I managed to get it out like with a tenth of a second. I know before you got this clue right, I believe it was a lock game uh, mm -hmm. going into finals. So was there any like rationale behind wagering 5,000? Did you like glance up at the scores and say like, okay, maybe this is like the minimum I have to like wager or were you just like, was just 5,000 just a, a nice number? The five, well, so there were a couple things to play there. One was that 5,000, when I was practicing the game at home, 5,000 was my general um, daily double wager when I felt decently about a category mm. and didn't feel the pressure to go higher. So 5,000 was was kind of the prime in my head of the first thing to say. And so the first thing that popped in my head is you should bet $5,000. And I looked up at the board and quickly and saw where Mateo was. And there was only like a couple of clues left on the board at that point. So there wasn't going to be much opportunity to recover if I got it wrong, but I had to bet big. I couldn't really bet any less than that because then it would have been a runaway game. And I didn't want her to run away with it. That was my goal was to keep her from running away with, with it and hoping that I could eke something out in final. But I also didn't want to go for the true daily because I wanted to have money and be able to play Final Jeopardy. So in my head, I was already pre-primed for 5,000. And I looked at the board, quickly did the numbers in my head and said, yeah, 5,000 seems right. We're going to go with 5,000. So the Final Jeopardy category for this game was USA, which is probably one of the vaguest categories I've ever seen on the show. USA could imply anything from geography, history, politics. Really don't know what it could be until the clue is read. However, once the clue was revealed, it seemed as if the stars aligned for you because the correct response ended up being Hartsfield Jackson, which is probably the airport you flew out of before landing in Los Angeles. Was this an instant get for you, like Ken implied after your response was revealed, or did this final require a little bit of mulling over? No, I got it right away. And that and it, it made me a really poor judge of how difficult the clue was in real time. Mm. Because you're right. USA was incredibly vague. Incredibly vague. I, I had no idea what I was in for. I don't think anybody did because that's that's almost as bad as saying that the, the category is trivia. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I made I sort of made my wager independently of the category because I couldn't. There wasn't really much within the category to take into account as far as how it might impact my general Final Jeopardy performance. But when the clue came up, I read. You know, Ken reads it through once, and my brain latched on to Coca Cola magnate and then latched on to two mayors. And I immediately went, oh, this is Hartsfield and Jackson because I knew they were both mayors. And anytime anyone says the word Coca-Cola in reference to a location, it's Atlanta. Mm -hmm. but that was the first thing that popped into my head. And then I reread the clue again and caught the bit about the racetrack. And I was like, 
yeah, an airport would be on an old racetrack. That makes sense. That's probably like the right size of thing. So I quickly wrote down Hartsfield and Jackson. And then I was like, that seems too easy. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting there looking at my answer like, ah, oh, I lost this game. There's no way Matea doesn't get this. This is a, not a hard clue. Uh, and, you know, in hindsight, that's not really the case. I do think it was actually a fairly difficult final and that it did it did require two names and the way it was, I mean, the clues were there for you to get it, but you really had to be able to piece them together and 30 seconds is not a lot of time. But in the moment, I thought it was, it was a lot easier than it was and I thought I was done. So in this next segment, we'll be talking about Final Jeopardy wager strategy and game theory for a bit. So for those listening, if this doesn't sound interesting to you, I've provided timestamps in the episode description to tell you when our next topic begins. I'll give our listeners some time to find them. Okay. Like in Roan's game against Amy, Danielle finds herself in a Final Jeopardy scenario known as a crush, where Danielle's win condition depends on Matea getting Final Jeopardy wrong and Danielle getting Final Jeopardy right. Thus, because Danielle's win condition depends on two factors, she should try to maximize her winnings and risk everything, or at least 7801 to beat Matea by a dollar if Matea decides to wager zero. Very unlikely, but hey, you, you never know. Instead, Danielle decided to wager 4200 which she called an infamous wager, but... I don't know, it actually wasn't when you do the math. And I'll let Danielle take over from here to explain why 4200 was her optimal wager. Yeah, so there's a couple things I did. The, the, the absolute first thing I did was figure out what Matea's wager was going to be. I'd had the chance to watch her play four games, um, and I knew how she would wager when she was in first place. She would absolutely do the copper bet. So mm. She was going to figure out what double my score was and then bet to be $1 over that and not any more or any less. Um, and rely on the fact that she's pretty good at Final Jeopardy and usually gets them right. I mean, she, I think pretty sure she had gotten every single one in the lead up to that. I knew with 99% certainty that that was what her wager was going to be. So I quickly calculated that. And as as you just said, I had she had to lose. There was no way for me to get this mm. into win without her losing. So then I subtracted that amount from her score to get the, uh, was it 15,599? Yeah. I think was the, was was what she would be at if she didn't get it right. And I said, okay. I have to then get to 15, six, um, if I get it right, I don't, I can go high. I can try to risk more if I want to, but that's, that is what I have to bet if I, if I want to have a chance of winning. Um, and so I wrote that down on my card and gave it a little bit of thought. I considered just going for it, doing the, the full, mm. uh, you know, double your money bet. I will say there were a couple of things that stopped me. The first was that Betsy actually had a decent amount of money. I think she had like $7,000 or something like that. Yeah. And if I made a big bet, there was a chance I ended up in third place. And I was like, well, if I'm probably going to lose, then I'm probably going to lose. I would rather lose in second than I would in third. And we had also, it was a hot topic on the set since we knew we were all uh, facing off against a super champion about this second chance tournament that mm. supposedly is going to happen. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, well, you know, I feel like I'd have a slightly, not that I thought that it would magically mean I got picked, but I felt like I'd have a slightly better chance of making it into the the last ch the second chance tournament if I had a little bit of a higher score. And as we discussed earlier, when I had been talking with my husband going into this, we discussed play to maximize earnings versus play to win. And so I had come in with the mentality that I was playing to win, not necessarily to maximize my earnings, although that's nice, but I was here to play to win. And in the moment, the more I thought about it, I just ultimately decided I was more comfortable with the bet that got me to 15-6. So all things considered, including the final Jeopardy category and potential invite to be in the second chance tournament, in your mind, were the odds of Betsy making a big wager or going all in more likely than, you know, her wagering zero? I figured she would probably make a big wager because what did she have to lose? She was already in third place. True. I guess that's the advantage of being in third is that you can't go down any further, right? Mm. You You... If you bet big in third place and you get it, then that's that could be a come from behind, right? Depending on how how the numbers work out. I mean, honestly, if Betsy had had even like a thousand or two thousand dollars more, it really would have changed my calculus and mm. probably would have forced me to bet higher because let's say Betsy had had nine thousand dollars. If she had doubled her score, she could have gotten to 18. Mm -hmm. So I would have adjusted my bet accordingly to make sure that Betsy couldn't come from behind and get over me. 
yeah, I think what you're describing kind of like goes into like Stratton's dilemma territory where you have to bet enough to cover third place. But at the same time, if you get it wrong, you can't win if all three of you get it wrong. So you have to either go either wager nothing or go to the extreme and like bet the farm. So, yeah, exactly. and, and that made it even more difficult having the category be USA because you can't you'd like to be able to adjust your final Jeopardy bet on the basis of either your performance in the category. And so my bet would have been radically different if I'd been able to look at the category and go, oh, I'm going to know this. Mm. Like if the category had been world geography or if the category had been Greek myth or the category had been Hugo award winners, I don't know, something along those lines, right? Where I could look at that and go, there's a 99% chance I know that that's, I know that answer. I'd have gone for it. I'd have gone all in, mm. right? But with the USA category being as vague as it was, I mean, my God, what is that? It could be anything. So I just, I didn't, I didn't feel as comfortable about my odds of knowing it and kind of just had to fall back on, okay, well, what is my normal final jeopardy get rate and hope that I, it wasn't in one of those, one of the areas where I was less comfortable. For game two, your game against Kareem and Emily, I don't have any other notes other than Final Jeopardy with the category being novel titles. Now, this might be a little bit presumptive of me, but I was kind of surprised you didn't get this get this one, Danielle. Though, to be fair, I don't know much about literature either, so uh, I read The Great Gatsby, but I don't know. <laughs> I would have probably I said think the same I, thing. I think I would have gotten it if I'd had like another 30 seconds. Hmm. This was one of those ones that I think was very possible to parse out if you had enough time to think about it. Hmm. Um, Cause I immediately started running through books from that time period in my head, trying to figure out what it could be. And actually I had had a literature study guide. So I had a good list of books that were from the twenties. Mm. And so I started running through them in my mind for whatever reason, I didn't run a farewell to arms in my head. I did run for whom the bell tolls in my head. And then that seems more like, doesn't seem like retirement. That seems like death. And so I tossed that one. And it kept going. And at this point, don't underestimate how long it takes you to actually write your answer. Mm. Like you, you really only have about 15 seconds to think because then you've got to start writing. Mm. And especially with like a longer book title, you have got to start writing like, or your answers, you're either not going to get all the words out or your answer's going to be completely illegible. I, ne I never wanted to leave anything blank. That mm. was a, that was a, a hard no for me. You never leave a blank. You always take a guess. Because you never know, your guess could be correct. Mm. I refused to leave it blanks. And at that point, I had to start writing. So I just went ahead and started writing The Great Gatsby thinking, I don't know, maybe that was his name. I can totally relate with that 15 second thing you mentioned. Because I, I know with my final Jeopardy, I was like staring at the clue for the longest time. And I said to myself, if I don't have anything by 15 seconds, I got to start writing or else I'm going to be in trouble. And yeah, it really does feel like you have only 15 seconds to come up with a response. Because yeah, it, it takes a while to get that light pen to like write out who is or what is the answer. Because yeah, I think they I think they actually have you write what is before Final Jeopardy. Is that right? They have you write who or what. They don't let you write the verb because the clue might be plural. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but they will have you write who who or what in advance, which is good. That does help, but it's still you know, you know, the answer was a farewell to arms. Time yourself and see how long it takes you to write a farewell to arms in a way that's legible. Mm. It'll be longer than you think. And it means that you only have like half of that time realistically. Whereas at home, when you're sitting on your couch, you get the full 30 seconds because you just have to blurt it out. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Finally, we have your third game against Mallory and Sherry. Before we get into it, were you able to talk to Mallory during your downtime about books and lit as authors yourselves? Have you read Mallory's book, The 100? Are you familiar with the show? I was. I'm familiar with the show. I had. I actually didn't know it was based on books. I didn't, and I didn't really realize it until we were actually on set filming the episode. And they're like, oh, you're the author of the book series. The show, The 100, was based off of. And I I really wish they had had a camera on me when that was said, because you can see my jaw drop as I looked over at Mallory next to me. I'm like, oh my God, I'm standing next to a very famous author. Yeah, but I did get a chance to talk to Mallory a little bit um, after uh, about the, you know, the world of publishing, because I think Mallory actually works as an editor in addition to writer mm. uh, books. And so we did have a little bit of a conversation about what it's like to you know query a novel and to try to break it into a traditional pub, which is, I mean, traditional and self-publishing they each have their own challenges and advantages and i would really love to go the, tra the traditional pub route but the, you know getting in the door is the tricky thing there mm. so yeah we had a good conversation about it and about the you know the things she's seeing in the industry and and the challenges she's seeing um uh, as being like a little bit more in the door that a lot more in the door than i am <laughs> let's be real um so that was really good i i had a really 
lovely conversation with her afterwards. In this game, the box score indicated that you ran the category outside your house, which leads me to ask if you have some sort of affinity for exterior design at all, or am I just reading too much into it? Um, you know, I knew that I had run that category and I, I actually got a good chuckle out of it later. I have to wonder if the reason that I actually ran that category as opposed to my opponents um, is because I do actually own a house. Um, and for my age bracket and the millennial generation in general, I feel like that's less common. Mm. Um, but I live in a, in a market where that way, where it was possible to get in. I was actually the third house I've owned. My husband and I have sold houses a couple of times and traded up. It's, it's not necessarily that I do a lot of exterior work or anything like that, but when you own a house, you know, you have to know certain things about how to maintain the property and the way the plumbing works and things like that. So, you know, just as an example, like the, the, the clue that was about the mailbox, literally like six or seven months prior when we were at our previous house, the guy who was mowing our lawn mowed our mailbox over. Oh. <laughs> and so we had to have a new mailbox <laughs> put up at our house. So I was very familiar with like how far it had to be from the curb and like all the restrictions associated with that. So yeah, I just, I, I truly think it's because I, I am a homeowner and I've owned a home for seven years now or something like that, that those answers were I need to think about those. Oh, well, that's funny. That's great. <laughs> so when the final Jeopardy category was revealed to be live music, you said in a Reddit comment that you were prepared to go out as a two-day champion. Outside of classical music, music isn't exactly a strong suit of yours, but you did come up with half the correct response, which was Woodstock and Coachella. Mallory was the only one to get final Jeopardy right, and she emerged as the new Jeopardy champion with 14,001. 14,100, excuse me. Uh, however, had Final Jeopardy been a triple stumper, you actually would have won with the way the wagers panned out. Obviously, none of this matters since this all happened months ago, but I think my explanation for why Mallory's wager was a risky one will highlight the importance of studying wager strategy, especially if you find yourself in second or third. Um, again, for listeners, if this doesn't interest you at all, the timestamp for our next topic can be found in the episode description. Going into Final Jeopardy, because Mallory's score was at least two-thirds of Danielle's, Mallory's win condition was dependent on Danielle getting Final Jeopardy wrong. If Mallory wagers $500 or less, she'll finish above Danielle by at least a dollar no matter what. Assuming Danielle wagers to cover Mallory's doubled score and gets Final Jeopardy wrong, Danielle will be left with 8599 Cherry is a non-factor in this situation because even if she doubles her score, she'll only have 5,600. By wagering 5,000, Mallory sort of endangered her chances of winning by overwagering. Capping her wager at 500 ensures Mallory's victory in a triple stumper, or if she's the only one to get Final Jeopardy right. I know it's pointless to ask now, but Danielle, was this something that ever occurred to you either after taping your last episode or shortly thereafter? It occurred to me, actually, as, as the credits were going out, I was like, that number is wrong. Like, I looked at it and I was like, she she didn't do her wager, at least not the way I would have done it in her mm. shoes. Like, I mean, I don't want to say anyone's logic is wrong, right? She she may have had a reason for doing it the way that she did, but I looked at it and I was like, from a game theory perspective, I don't think she wagered correctly. Maybe she had an extra zero or something. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't and I didn't quite know what it would happen because I because you know, I had done all the math again about like what double her score would be and like what I might like if she did a bet similar to the one I did that beat Mateo, like what that would would, would be. And I'm looking ahead and I'm like, that number's no, none of the numbers I calculated for her. So yeah, it did it did occur to me that it was a it was an odd wager that was risky, riskier mm. than it needed to be. Yeah. But like you said, she was the only one who got it right. Man, it's it, having to give two answers in in final is tough. Yeah. Um, you know, if it had been just give one of the one of them, I'd have got it right because I had Coachella. Yeah. It's 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 challenging, and yeah, like like you said, um, you saw that category of live music, and immediately like. My heart fell into my into into my feet. I was like, I have to hope for the same scenario that happened yesterday, where it's a triple stumper, because it's very unlikely that I'm gonna know what this clue is. I love music, but I'm not very good at remembering pop music artists and names outside of the ones that I personally like and listen to. Mm. And when I saw that it was live music, I was like, okay, if this is about like famous performances or something, I know a couple of those, but I'm probably not going to know the answer. And then as it turned out, it was about music festivals. And I know next to nothing about music festivals. I know, <laughs> I know the names of a couple and like vaguely where they're located. Um, and like occasionally here's some things about things that happen or who might've performed at one, but 
no one I know goes to music festivals. I don't go to music festivals. It's not a thing that I'm particularly into. When that clue came up, I was like, oh no, <laughs> this is exactly what I was afraid of. Mm. Coachella was a guess, but it was an educated one. Mm. I saw that 1999 date and I was like, I... Coachella's not that old. That feels right. And that's also the one that like everyone talks about, right? That's mm-hmm. like the most famous one. And usually, usually Final Jeopardy answers, if you can put the clues together, are not that hard, but you just have to put the clues together. Mm. And so I was like, I feel good about Coachella, but could not for the life of me come up with a festival that happened on the East Coast when I saw the answer was Woodstock. I was like, oh no, I should have gotten that. Well, I grew up in Pennsylvania. It's not that far. But, you know, that's the game. It is what it is, basically. Um, What you said actually reminded me of the Daily Double in your second game that Kareem got, where he had to list out three cities. I know a lot of people on uh, Twitter said, like, oh, that was kind of rough. He had to, like, I think it was, like, New York, Baltimore, Philly or something yeah, like that. I yeah, yeah. yeah, the Boswash Corridor. I felt so bad for Kareem when that came up. That That whole game was weird, honestly, because that wasn't the only clue in that game that required three answers. Really? Mm-hmm. There was a clue in the Nuremberg trials category that I got that also required three answers. Oh, wow. That's so I don't. And it wasn't rare. even a daily double. Yeah. So I don't know what was in the, the clue writer water cooler for that game. But <laughs> it was weird. That's a funny one. OK, so with the game related questions out of the way, let's return to the present and life after Jeopardy. Do you still keep in touch with your contestant cohort or have a group chat of some sort to share any life updates at all? Um, I'm, I'm like in, in touch a little bit with them. I haven't talked to anyone in, in probably like a week or so, but um, I I talked to Matea a good bit, especially in the lead up to the game where I won. Um, and she was just as kind and and um, just as wonderful um, as she had been on set. She she really did not have to be as nice as she was to the contestants and, and give the great advice that she did. And um, not only did she do it then, but then having dealt with the fame of being a 23 day Jeopardy champion for a couple of weeks by that point, you know, she was in my DMs, we were chatting back and forth and she gave me some tips about how to handle the amount of attention that was suddenly going to be on me when that episode aired, which was again, really kind. And she didn't have to do that, but yeah, I made it a point of trying to find people that, that I had interacted with on those two different tape days. Um, So I gathered a couple new friends on Facebook Mm. Um, of people who I, I met, I've gone. I went back and forth in email a couple of times with Daniel Nguyen, mm. uh, who who was in the game following my last game, uh, and one was two day champion. Um, actually, we, there were a lot of jokes on set that day about how awful it was going to be if Daniel and I were in the same game because it was going to be a nightmare for the host. From I am to call Danielle or Daniel. Oh. <laughs> um, but we but we we had a nice joke between the two of us about the power of the name because we had both won uh, two days. So uh, <laughs> Daniel found me initially and we had several really good conversations. So, yeah, I mean, I've talked to a couple people, even people that I didn't meet. You know, Ron and I talked a couple of times uh, on Twitter, which is really nice. Again, Ron reached out and um, very happy to talk to, to him, get get a little bit of insight into his situation with Amy and. He's a hoot. Uh, I really is there a group chat of like giant killers around, or <laughs> yeah, there should be. Honestly, I'm I'm like privately advocating and hoping that they do a giant slayers tournament because I think oh. that would be fun. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> I think that would be really fun. When Roan was on the podcast last episode, he he said that in unfamiliar group situations like taping for Jeopardy, you tend to gravitate towards one person who sort of acts like your buddy for the day. And his buddy turned out to be Maria Krasinski. Did you have someone like that during either of your taping days? Did you find yourself talking to one person more often than others? That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure that I did. I felt like I talked to most of the contestants um, as much as I could. Every both the day, both the days I was there taping, everyone was so nice, and we had such good conversations. I mean, I can tell you some of the people who stood out. Um, you know, Becky was was fantastic. Um, she was in the Monday game the week I beat Natea, and she had been the alternate for the previous day, so she had seen what was coming, but she was, but she also had kind of had been there for a tape day already and sort of knew what was happening and was really just jovial and fun to talk to behind the set. Um, I felt similarly about Sarah who um, almost beat Matea mm, in the Thursday, yes, game. The Thursday game. And we were, we were, we were hooting and hollering in our seats for Sarah. We thought she was going to win. We were like so excited for her. And then we were so devastated for her. Um, and we were all like second chance, second chance. Uh, still a second chance for Sarah. She should be in it. So they were they were both fantastic and really, really fun to talk to. There was, um, I already mentioned that I had had a blast with Daniel 
uh, on my second tape day, just joking around because of the name thing. Uh, I really, I thought I got along great with Cherry as well. Mm. Um, and she and I had a couple of really fun conversations in the audience. Kareem was lovely. Mm. Um, Kareem stayed the whole tape day. Shout out to Kareem. Uh, he was amazing to watch on TV. He was. He was a sweet kid, honestly. He, that kid's going places. Mm. He was great. And yeah, he stayed the whole day, even after he lost and was just, he was a hoot to talk to as well. So that's probably the people I talked to the most. But I mean, I, I tried to make it a point to talk to everyone at least once mm. and and like, I didn't, I, especially coming back the second day, I felt kind of obligated to sort of pay it forward from how kind Matea had been. Mm. She was very approachable the whole tape day. And if you went to her and you asked her a question about the way the game worked or what she thought worked best, and and she would tell you, she wasn't trying to hide anything. She wasn't trying to, you know, defend her strategy or anything like that she was very open and really just trying to have fun and encourage the rest of us to have fun the whole time and Mm. i was so struck by how much better that made the day for me and for the other contestants Mm. that when i came in the next on my next tape day i i wanted to pay that forward i wanted to give that same experience to the other contestants so i don't know i hope i succeeded maybe you can talk to one of them and find out (laughs) yeah i think one of the things that's most important aside from like trying to like do your best on jeopardy is to have fun because you know if if you don't win you want to make the most out of the experience you're probably only going to be there once so yeah it's nice to hear that matea was like approachable and just made you and everyone else's experience just more uh, better, I suppose. Yeah. And and like you said, I mean, statistically speaking, and again, they, knowing this going in, two thirds of people don't win Jeopardy. Mm. The odds are against you, right? There's only a certain number of people that are going to win and you hope it's you. Mm. You feel less likely that it's going to be you when you go in and there's a super champion. Ultimately, your chances of losing are better than your chances of winning. So yeah, you want to make the most of it while you're there. You want to have as much fun as possible. At the end of the day, it is a game. And games are supposed to be fun. Was there a part of the Jeopardy contestants experience that surprised you at all? Something that you weren't expecting, maybe? Being on the wheel set. Oh, yes, of course. I was not expecting that at all. So for context, and I don't know if this is something that's been ongoing for a while or if this is COVID related or what, but when we when we got there and they uh, we had to meet in the parking garage, which is weird. Mm -hmm. But um, when they take us in, they took us into the wheel of fortune set. And that was where wardrobe, hair, makeup, all that jazz was taking place. And then when all that was done, they would walk us over to the Jeopardy studio. But I was not expecting to actually get to like be on the Wheel of Fortune set at all, even mm. though I kind of suspected they would be right next to each other. So that was fun and kind of fascinating. The wheel was not as big as I thought it was. The wheel <laughs> was huge. And so does the board. Like the um, the board that Vanna walks in front of it always looks gigantic t- to me mm. on TV, but it it actually isn't that big in person. So that was kind of interesting. I was like, this, this is like figuring out what this, the real scale of things were on the wheel set was, was surprising. I kind of had like the opposite experience. I felt like the wheel set was like much bigger I, from the way I saw it. Did you, did you get to spin the wheel at all? <laughs> no, they told us we weren't allowed to touch. Ah, darn. <laughs> Um, um, the first day I was there, they were they were preparing for what I think ended up being like their 39th anniversary week or whatever. Mm. So they were still like they were actively working on the set while we were in there getting our hair and makeup done. It was a lot quieter when I came back in two weeks. Yeah, I think I read somewhere that when wheel tapes, they use the Jeopardy stage for hair and makeup and vice versa. So it, it might not just be like a COVID restriction thing. Uh, who knows? Did you think the Jeopardy set was as big as you thought it would be or did you think it was just right the jeopardy set was just right mm. it was exactly what i pictured in my head and and i did have a, a bit of a starstruck moment when we walked in for the first time and came out in the little audience area that they had set up and i got my first glimpse of the set and i just had a moment where i was like oh my god i'm on the jeopardy set and it mm. looks exactly like i pictured it did you feel cold at all while you were up on stage no actually i don't think i could feel anything happening with my body while i was on stage <laughs> Uh, the music started and then my soul departed. <laughs> Perfect way to describe it. Are there any other behind the scenes stories or conversations that you like to share with our listeners? Maybe something that happened when the cameras weren't rolling? Um, it's, it is funny watching it while it's being taped versus watching it live. You, you really don't realize, you know, if you're an avid game show watcher, I'm sure you've probably seen the disclaimers that most game shows have where they say things like, you know, portions of this that didn't impact the outcome have been edited or like mm. blah, blah, blah. And you see that and you're like, oh yeah, you know, they probably like, but you don't really know what they edited out. Mm. And so it's interesting to see, to go back and watch and see and and to get to see it live and then get to see it, the recorded version, the the version that airs and kind of see the way that they've trimmed things 
or like smoothed over when they had to make a ruling or the game had to be paused briefly because you know things happen i mean Mm -hmm. uh the first day i was there the board glitched Mm. and one of the clues didn't show up and so they had to stop the game everybody had to put the buzzers down they had to turn around this wasn't in my taping i was in the audience but Mm. um and they had to like fix the board (laughs) because the clue hadn't come up and i think they had to chunk that clue because ken had started reading it and they they have backup clues mm. for the category fun story um so they had to slot in one of the backup clues and they got it fixed it probably only stopped things for maybe like 15 minutes and then they kept going um but that's the sort of thing you just you have no idea that stuff happens when you're watching along at home and e- mm-hmm. even things like i'm pretty sure i like talked a little bit in the lead up to some of my daily doubles and i think they cut some of that out which that's totally fine totally get it but i think there was some of that that got cut out and um, they do. They just make these like little tweaks. The other thing is to, you get this impression watching it at home that the hosts are like perfect mm. at reading the clues. And I don't know if you've ever tried to read Jeopardy clues for someone. My best friend did that a lot for me in the lead up and she struggled. She had a hard time because sometimes reading them for the first time, like you don't, it's hard to get the cadence right or to figure out where the pauses are and the best way to articulate it. And so she kept making comments about how difficult it was. And I was like, well, you're just not as good at this, this the Jeopardy host. They do this all the time. <laughs> but then you you get there and you realize that the Jeopardy hosts aren't gods either. They also make mistakes, sometimes during play. And you're warned that you should always go by what the clue is says as written not by what the host says because they'll go back and have the host retape if the host makes a mistake or if they just don't like that particular reading of the clue and then they can sub that in because guess what you don't actually see the host read the clue because they put up the text Mm. so just little things like that i thought were were very fascinating to see um that actually getting to watch it be taped have you read any messages or reactions from randoms on social media has anyone from your distant past suddenly reached out to congratulate you and if so do you mind sharing some of the more memorable interactions with us yeah um I feel like in the days after I beat Matea in particular, basically every person I have ever known in my life Mm. uh, reached out to me in some way, shape, or form. Whether that was a Facebook message, replying to me on Twitter, sending me a DM, messaging me on LinkedIn, commenting on LinkedIn, commenting on Facebook, just like everybody that I know people I haven't talked to in years Mm. who came out to congratulate me. And that was, I mean, it it did, it meant a lot. And it was way more people than I could individually respond to. Mm. Coming with that, there were, you know, also the internet trolls, Mm. shall we say, um, or people who, you know, don't have something nice to say and want to say it anyway, um, which sort of comes with existing on the internet and having, you know, any degree of fame or attention for a brief period of time. Um, I actually kind of had to stop reading comments on Twitter because it wasn't, it wasn't good for my mental headspace. Mm. My husband was monitoring Reddit and my best friend, my best friend was monitoring Twitter. Mm. They'd let me know like, Hey, like people on Twitter are like saying this about you without me having to actually go look at the thing so that if there was like a negative comment, I didn't actually have to see it. But you know, a few things slipped through here and there. Um, and I also got my fair share of weird things to one guy who like messaged me very creepily on Facebook that I absolutely did not know, such as the life of being a woman on the internet. Mm. Um, but overall, everything was very, very positive. And um, I think the thing that was the most meaningful that I got out of that was all of my teachers, mm, particularly yes, my teachers. Yes. Uh, my teachers from high school, my teachers from middle school, even, and my teachers from college who were so excited and so proud of me, um, especially the ones who had known me when I was little. And, you know, back when I originally started trying out for Jeopardy and the ones who, you know, saw potential in a, in a 12 year old, 13 year old girl, the, those messages from the teachers, those were the ones that made me tear up. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's nice to see nice to hear that you had like your support system act as some sort of like filter to like only like filter out like maybe the good things about like what people are saying for you on social media because i think that's really important to like you can see like positive comments and it can uplift you but even that one negative comment can like bring your whole mood down so it's nice to hear that you only like received the positive things presumably and yeah the teachers too i can relate to that in the regard that before my episode of the jncc aired i cold emailed literally every single teacher I could find from middle school all the way to college I had to like dig deep to like find their like latest emails maybe they like moved to a different school or whatever 
but I dug deep and I got like a list of like 30 or so teachers sent out the same email to each one of them saying like, Hey, I'm going to be on the show. And I got a lot of responses from them saying like, Oh my God, I remember you. This is great. I know one of my middle school teachers was really touched that I remembered them and like reached out. Cause like, it really meant a lot that, you know, they had an impact on my life. So I, I just wanted to like say hi to them, um, let them know what's going on in my life. And um, I remember after the tournament aired, I went back to my former middle school and I got to do my rounds and like see old teachers that were still there. And I got to speak to a few students about what it was like being on the show. And actually yesterday, the day before we're recording this, I went to my high school's alumni day panel and I got to meet a couple of teacher, high school teachers that also saw me on the show. So it was really nice to like reconnect with everyone and, you know, thank them for, you know, teaching me and supporting me by watching the show. So, yeah, that was really yeah, nice. I- I have nothing but the greatest respect for teachers. And and I think that particularly with Jeopardy being such an academic game, mm. there's a certain amount of debt you owe to the teachers who, mm. who spent time with you and, and who really, you know, who believed in you and supported you growing up. And it meant a lot because especially because too, you know, you think, oh my God, it's been like 20 years since I've been in high school. Right. You, you think after a certain point, you're like, oh, they don't remember me anymore. Mm. But I think it really goes to show that, that their students are special to them and they don't forget. Mm and they're still just as proud of you. At last, we've reached the final question of our interview today. So before I let you go, Danielle, what was the best purchase you've made with your winnings thus far? And if you have any, haven't bought anything cool yet, what do you plan on splurging on? Uh, well, I haven't gotten my money yet, so uh, I have not bought anything with it, but I will tell you what I intend to do with it. So my current house we bought uh, has a basement that is completely unfinished. And right now we're just storing a bunch of junk down there. But the intention when we when we bought the house was that at some point we would finish that basement and it would become my craft room. Mm. And I would get to decorate it however I wanted. I could get uh, my husband even agreed that I can hire a uh, an interior designer if I want to help me like make it exactly the way that I want it to be you know, get whatever I need down there, have room to set up all of my cosplay machinery sewing machine, 3D printer, serger, all that stuff, you know, get mannequins to hold my cosplays and things like that. The money that I earned is going to go to starting the process of finishing that basement. I don't know if it will cover the whole thing, but it'll cover most of it. Nice. That sounds really exciting, especially to the 3D printer. I think that's a really cool addition. Do you like print props or what? Yeah, so I, I got the 3D printer for two reasons. Actually, it was a Christmas gift from my parents and I haven't set it up yet because I wanted to put it in like its home before I delicate i didn't want to move it around a bunch but i bought it for two reasons one is for printing props for cosplay um just because you know it's a little easier in some circumstances to just go ahead and 3d print something than to try to physically construct it mm. um and then the other reason i got it is because i'm a i'm a big fan of tabletop games stuff like dnd oh. uh, and i wanted to be able to print my own minis because buying your minis is expensive amazing and with that that brings us to the end of today's episode thank you so much danielle for coming on to the podcast to talk about yourself your incredible victory over matea and your run overall i can't believe i'm saying this but i'm sure i'll be interviewing the next giant killer who defeats ryan once his run yep. comes to an end I'll be keeping an eye out. Before we sign off, where can people find you online? Is there anything or anyone you'd like to plug or shout out? Go right ahead. Oh, gosh. Um, I don't think I have anything that I, I necessarily want to plug at the moment. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Danny Declares. Danny is D-A-N-Y. Um, I haven't been super active on that account for a couple of weeks because I was taking a break, but I'll be back to it soon. Uh, and it's probably going to devolve into a bunch of nerdy stuff. So if you like nerdy stuff, you can come find me there. Um, and you can also, if you're interested in the cosplay side of things in particular, you can find me on Instagram. My handle is at Thali Alata. It's T-H-A-L-I-A-L-A-T-A. That is where I post all of my, um, uh, all of my different cosplays and the photos that I've taken as well as in progress stuff. So you can see what I'm up to um, and where I'm going to be next as far as conventions. And then if you're interested more in sort of the writing journey of things, um, I do also have a website at www.daniellemauer.com. And and that is, I have a book review blog there that I've been away from for a little bit, but need to go back to this year. Um, And I also periodically will post things about how things are going with my books and if I ever make any progress on getting into traditional publishing, it will be there. 
Perfect. Yeah, I'm really excited for what you have in store for the future. And now this is when I close out the show by asking you to please rate this podcast on whatever platform you're listening to. Post Podium is available on all sorts of listening platforms, including Amazon Music, Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Radio Public, Spotify, and Stitcher. So make sure to follow and subscribe for the latest episodes. I've been your host, Jarek Ruel. And remember, if someone asks what you're listening to, always phrase your response in the form of the question, what is Post Podium? See you next time.